welcome to the Keen on Yoga podcast, bringing you the stories of many people who in various ways are attempting to walk the path of yoga. Our intention is to inspire your own practice and commitment to yoga beyond the mat and in all areas of life. We consider this an offering, a service to the community and labour of love. If you feel inclined, any donations are appreciated, just visit our page and click the donate button at www.keelonyoga.co.uk forward slash podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. In this Keelon Yoga podcast, I have the pleasure to talk to Kimberly Flynn, known to everyone as Kiki. Kiki began yoga practice in 1982 while studying for a degree in the moving arts. In 93, she discovered Ashtanga when Vitabi Joyce came to New York for the Jivan Mukti school where she was teaching and practicing at the time. His visit made a huge impact on her and in the same year she took her first trip to Mysore and over the years she spent 13 trips to Mysore, sometimes studying for six months at a time. She went back for the last three days before Patabi Joyce passed away and was very close to him. Kiki later moved to LA and opened her own shala and she's also renowned for her chanting and has released two CDs with her teacher Jashri from Mysore. She's quite incredible on this front. Kiki is now a mentor and a coach to many. She shares a perspective on yoga in the broadest sense. Not only asana, but everything lifestyle. A remarkable person leading a colourful life, including being approached by the CIA three times as a recruit and setting the world record for the longest downward dog. She now lives on a boat on the Hudson River. It was my pleasure to speak to Kiki and you can find out more about her on her website, www.kikinyc.com. Welcome, Kiki, to the Keenan Yoga podcast. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for inviting me. I understand that we met years ago when I was um, co-helming Hamish Hendry Shala while he and his family were in Mysore. And I think that's 2005. That's right. And so think, very nice to meet you again. You wouldn't remember. You, I, if you did, I would have been a terrible student and very badly behaved, I'm sure. But you know, you know what? If you're still doing Ashtanga, I can only assume that you were an excellent student. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about your journey with yoga and, and a little bit about Ashtanga? Sure. Mm. I studied theater and uh, from a young age, I was very interested in, I'm, I would say I'm a natural storyteller and um, I grew up in a pretty literary home. My dad worked in publishing. He worked in sales and distribution. We had a lot of books in our home. And when I was in those, I guess that they call it like young adult fiction now. Um, but there were, you know, books written for like novels written for young readers, like five to eight or nine to 12 or whatever it was. And my father worked for a company when I was a kid that had a, a, a young adult um, imprint of yearling books. So all these books came in the house and I really went through like the five to eight, I finished those. And then I was always reading kind of ahead. And then I started reading, you know, kind of, I read Herman Hesse, you know, Siddhartha, which obviously is a big influence for many yoga people, probably of earlier generations, like um, yeah. Alan Watts or Ram Dass or people like that. Um, so I probably read that when I was 13 because it was there on the shelf. So I was very, inf I loved reading stories. I loved telling stories, writing stories, dance, movement, expression, everything like that. Um, and so I went off to university and I studied acting and theater and I studied experimental theater and so this was kind of very movement-based theater and um, very expressive and um, what we would, you know, influence and a lot, everything, everything was included. Mm -hmm. So this body is an instrument. I want to express it as fully as I right. can without limitation. This voice is an instrument and I want to express it as fully as possible. So most of our, my teachers were, you know, actively directing and writing in New York theater, maybe coming out of the 50s or the 60s, 70s, or contemporary in the 80s then. And many great people like from Grotowski's Polish Lab Theater coming over to teach us. And so yoga was being integrated into some of our movement therapy. And I really 
loved it. Uh, I heard uh, Leslie Kamenoff speak with you and he said like he relaxed in Shavasana or something. It was the first time he'd ever actually relaxed. I had the identical experience, Adam, where I was in a, and the teacher said, we're going to do a little yoga and now we're going to do this relaxation. And I was like, I don't want to do relaxation. I don't want to do yoga. I want to do voice and speech. And she talked us through some visualization. I passed out. And then she called us back at at some point as I was dropping through the layers of my nervous system, I felt my shoulders lit, you know, like go clunk. And I felt my legs go like clunk. (laughs) And I, I was like, this is amazing. And I started doing my own home yoga practice. I later learned that was Kundalini yoga. But as I continued in university, someone would say, oh, we're going to do headstands. Oh, we're going to do sun salutations. We're going to do this. Headstands, no problem. I mean, I ran into a professor of mine. I moved, I had left New York for many years. I moved back about 11 or 12 years ago. And I ran into one of my professors from the 80s, experimental movement. And he said, wow, look at you. You embody everything we taught. We said the body is an instrument. You have to look after it. He's like, wow, you looked after your instrument. Like you're fit, you're mobile, you're, and he said, they don't make them like they, they don't make them like you guys from your error. And I said, yeah, when you said throw yourself at the wall, I asked how hard. When you said jump high, I said, how high? Like we were like, we were radical and Mm -hmm. I wanted to create radical theater, radical movement forms, things that people didn't see. I wanted to like express the great Greek catharsis, um, which is really the foundation of theater is to take the audience through the catharsis, through the change. And so In my university studies, I was also exposed to Tai Chi, Feldenkrais method, Alexander method. I'm not sure. Does that go with the acting? Because I mean, sorry to interrupt, but I'm just kind of thinking. I want to get as much out of you as I can in this this podcast. You've got to got these two kind of seem like, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Discordant, kind of seemingly discordant paths, and one is like a very visceral, you know, um, expressive. Uh, aspects of you know acting and you know I, you know I think you've you know you've acted obviously professionally you know you've been in proper films and stuff you know and then you, you know right like you know not just, just like trying you know a bit of acting you know you've actually right. done I, it, pa- you know. I, I crossed the just trying to act yeah, yeah. Well, you, you moved to LA and you actually kind of did it yes right? just for yeah people to know you were a bona fide actor yes. and, uh, actress. and uh, you know but also you know you've, you know, you've got the chanting with uh, Jashri you know from my tour people might know Jashri she's a beautiful lady and you know um, and, and you know very devotional aspects and you know, obviously this this practice with you from, from the early years how do those two things fuse together that you, when you first had the relaxation with the yoga it doesn't seem to square with this kind of like expressive or, or how hard should I push myself against throw myself against that wall did you notice a discrepancy or, or did you manage to, I mean, how does that relate together? <laughs> For me, there was no discrepancy. It was right. about, and it still is about some kind of optimal peace of mind. Mm-hmm. So that comes from the relaxation. Obviously I was a night in, in my relaxation moment. I was a 19 year old girl. Um, I was trying to understand who I was. I was, I would say I was foisted into a world of adulthood before I was ready. Um, but I just had to come to grips with that. Uh, you know, I went to high school in the seventies. I, uh, lived in New York city in the eighties. I traveled quite a lot, uh, through, you know, I got my Euro pass and traveled through Europe and traveled to, you know, to Greece, to Turkey. Um, and in New York city, like, one really had to be a badass to mm. live in New York City. And one really had to to be tough or to go to high school in the 70s. It's like, hey, the boys were in charge. And it was completely acceptable for boys to kind of line the hallway and uh, loudly comment on uh, one's physical appearance. And that was tough. 
And I had a physical appearance that uh, from a young age, boys and men commented on. And it was, it was obviously not all boys and men do that, but there was enough of a percentage of boys and men that did. I always say it's a wonder that any building was, you know, erected in New York City in the 80s. Because whenever a woman walked by a construction site, every construction worker, there might have been one or two who kept the hammer moving, every construction worker stopped working and catcalled. And I can say it was some kind of a gog sense of humor. It was... No, now you literally get fired for that. It was shameful, you know, one was filled with shame and women used right. to sit. We would stop each other. If, you know, I was about to turn down a street, a woman would stop me and say, don't take 46th street. There's a construction site. And it'd be like, Oh my God, thank you for telling me. So I would like, you know, take 47th street. It really was that bad. Men uh-huh. hung their heads out of windows, like cartoon mm-hmm. characters you know, Mm. whistling and like wolves. Mm. And so it's like, we had to be tough. And I wanted to be in New York City. I wanted to be in the arts. I wanted to be in Bohemia. New York City Mm. was broke. The the state said, F you, New York City. We don't care about you. There's a great documentary on Mayor Koch um, when he was a great mayor. And uh, the city was, it was in a shambles. There were 300 fires burning a day in the South Bronx because landlords would rather burn their buildings with illegal arson to Mm. collect insurance than maintain the buildings. Of course, we know this has led to terrible urban blight. So for those of us that went to New York City, Uh, you know, you you had to be tough, even if you weren't. So I had this kind of tough, badass thing, even at 16, 17, 18, 19, and I wanted to express, and I was expressive. Um, you know, one of my great moments on the street was when, you know, there was a group of construction workers. You pass people very closely on the street in New York. And one construction worker said, hey, I like your big, and a word that I hate, and I'm not going to use it, but it refers to a woman's upper body. And I turned around and I looked at this guy and I said, hey, I like your big gut and he was so shocked and his friends started laughing so hard they actually fell on the sidewalk but so anyway did I need to relax absolutely you know it was like putting on the armor every day going to the streets of New York and then striving I mean striving to to express in a way that a young artist could believe had not been expressed yet to move beyond the boundaries. And absolutely is yoga consciousness, yoga, that is the, like the Nirodha is moving beyond the boundaries of limited consciousness into this illuminated vast consciousness. So for me, acting, playing roles, I love all that going to India and putting on a sari. I mean, I was in some kind of, you know, drama. Like, I love costumes. <laughs> Wearing a sari, like, if, was magnificent for me. And wearing a sari created so much goodwill between me and the community and so much invitation for cultural exchange and cultural appreciation. Right. You didn't so feel it was just like it all goes together for me. And then learning the yeah. sutras, I mean, I've learned vast tra- I I memorized entire plays and you know, hundreds of sonnets. And mm. particularly being in like the first and second form in London. I lived in London at that time in a British school. Mm-hmm. We had to memorize so much and I loved it. And then learning the sutras in the way that Dr. Jayashri originally taught us in this traditional manner. We didn't have books. We just learned through call and response chanting. Mm -hmm. And um, Paul Dallahan was an actor. I was an actor. Alex Medin, an actor. All of them magnificent memories. And um, I had memorized uh, the first three chapters of the Yoga Sutras. And Jay Shri, who's very clever, she said, oh, Paul was just here. 
he has memorized all four. And I was like, Paul has memorized all four chapters. Well, if Paul can do it, I can do it. And thank you, Paul. That was a huge inspiration. It's almost like breaking the four minute mile. The four minute mile was not broken and one person broke it. And very quickly, many people broke the four minute mile. And so Paul Dallahan broke the four minute mile for memorizing for a non-Indian to memorize the entire Yoga Sutra that I knew of. And so I thought, okay, I can do it too. Um, so, and chanting the Yoga Sutra and teaching the Yoga Sutra and studying the Yoga Sutra, I would say is one of my most beloved forms of uh, yoga sadhana, yoga practice. Yeah. But isn't it, I mean, it doesn't strike you as a discipline or a sense of, how would you say, a contriteness to authority and respect which somehow has a slight you know does it does it not have a difference to that part of your life which is very expressive and almost anarchic seeming just like when you yes. went to India and slightly it's not a word that's used anymore really but it's a slightly straight edge kind of like, like yes. image of the you know of the of the Mysore star student right and you probably would have fitted into it because I know that you know at the time I met you I'm sure that you were pretty, you know, dead on practice every day, early oh, morning. absolutely. You know. And then, you know, you know, that always, doesn't go I always in. I had mentors. I would say I always had mentors. So and at that point, so, it was really not cool to express. I mean, it's like in my soul, you didn't really express. You certainly didn't post images of yourself and you weren't like, that wasn't cool, right? So did that part of your when life? When I went to Mysore in 1995, right. I had just spent 99, like $109 for a Canon one shot that had a digit, like a little zoom that like you pushed a button and went and it had film in it. Um, yeah. So we certainly were not, you know, every frame, if you had brought six rolls of film with you, you'd count it out every frame that you were going to shoot. And then to develop yeah. your film was very expensive. Mm -hmm. So you really didn't want to take any bad pictures and, we certainly didn't do um, much uh, selfie-ing back in those days. Yoga is a radical path. Uh, the experimental theater that I studied is a radical path. Moving to the East Village, uh, really a, a place that was in terrible urban blight um, with open drug sales, drug use on the streets, a lot of um, hardship. But it was where artists moved because they could afford the rent and low rent meant less hours working for dollars and more hours for making art or, and watching art and going to art mm -hmm. and going to theater and going to performance and taking dance class and yoga class. And so for me, you know, my biggest attraction was to live. I wanted to live in Bohemia. I wanted to, be around artists. I wanted to be stimulated in that way. That was quite radical. There were anyone that was living in the East Village was really kind of radical minded around art and expression and very expansive minded around art and expression. I first met Sharon and David of Jiva Mukti in the art world in the East Village. Mm. Uh, Leslie Kamenoff, I heard he had a theater background. He was Did in the East village um the where the first jiva mukti was in um kind of a basement of a building that was on avenue b that's where guy donahue you know began to teach ashtanga yoga um so many people i think cindy lee of om yoga and so many people coming were artists in the east village and were interested in expansion were radical and embraced yoga Mm -hmm. We embraced yoga and I was still very, I still took dance classes, you know, out of college. I still continued to take dance classes. So I worked in the, in dance in the theater. I wrote and performed one woman shows. I worked with a really great, fun, exciting theater company, many theater companies, but um, I would, I had run in high school. I loved running. When I ran, I woke up every morning before school, 365 days a year in the snow, in the rain People would say to me, did, did, were you running, you know, this morning at 6 a.m. in the snow? And I'd be like, yeah. So I've always, like, 
ah, oh, you know, I had something yeah. to like be mm-hmm. intense and to express. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I was, you know, going to a yoga class in the morning from the East Village, um, five mornings a week at 8 a.m., that was very early. Very few people went to a gym. It, it's such a different era. And um, I would also run over to a nearby like public park that had, you know, soccer fields and baseball fields and a track. And I would run over there um, and I would run on the track and people would see me coming back. They'd be like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm running. So at that time, people didn't run. They didn't take dance classes. They didn't do yoga. I would be walking to yoga class and people would would be coming home from after hours clubs and they'd be like, Mm -hmm. Hey man, where are you going? Is any, like, is there another club that's still open? <laughs> Cause we'll follow you there. And I was like, I'm going to yoga and people would be like, you're wild. I mean, we were radicals and we were doing something and even, so there was a precedence obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, and anyone that's read Emerson or Thoreau or Goethe, you know, there's a precedence or, or um, uh, Allen uh, Ginsberg, you know, the beat poets and the hippies and whatever, the Beatles. I mean, all that's before my time, but it was in my, you know, it was on my periphery growing up. Yeah. I under- it sounds like very intense and, you know, and, and your message now it's kind of quite balanced, right? Like, I mean, I, I saw this thing recently where you were asking them the question of how much yoga should we do? You know, like how much right. is enough? And you were suggesting it could be 15 minutes. And that is very different to this earlier version of yourself that was super intense. And, you know, I mean, you know, you were very involved in the Mysore scene and, you know, very Absolutely. long with you. I, I the practice, I'm sure. And how has that, how has your mentality evolved from there, you know, and what was the shift? I mean, and, you know, I know there's a few occurrences in your life which made a shift, but how did that transition, you know? Um, I mean, I would yeah. say that I, right now I'm living on a sailboat. I'm mm. traveling um, around near, you know, through one of the most sailing, the most um, exalted sailing locations in the world, the Long Island Sound which is between Long Island and New York State, Connecticut, Rhode Island, obviously some of the greatest American sailing coming out of Connecticut, Mm. Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Maine. That's pretty intense. I sailed. (laughs) There's a giant bridge called the Throgs Neck Bridge. It's where the East River of New York City meets the Long Island Sound. And when you come down the East River, you go through an area called Hellgate where the river is swirling. And, um, and it's, you know, Hellgate. People are like, oh my God, you're going through Hellgate, you know, prepare in this way. And, um, it apparently means bright passage in Dutch. <laughs> but <laughs> so, um, we dropped anchor in a tiny bay, all, no other boats around, just outside the Throgs Neck Bridge, this massive bridge that goes from, you know, the Bronx to Queens and set our alarm and picked up anchor at um, 2.30 a.m. and went under the Throgs Neck Bridge through the Whitestone Bridge into the East River, uh, down through Hellgate. The water was swirling. It was white capping. um, And our engine actually died at some point. And... (laughs) We stayed and this little puff of wind, Adam, we were like, our sail was just hanging there, clanking, and we're drifting and we're ready to drop anchor if we get into, you know, less than 40 feet and hold ourselves from like being run over by a barge. And um, a little puff of wind came. My ability to stay calm, to stay steady, to stay safe. To me, that is my yoga mind. I think a yoga mind is strategic. It's efficient. Um, There's viveka, there's discernment. How can we decide, you know, what is the correct uh, next step here? To Mm. have that pratyaya awareness of one's immediately 
arising thought and to really watch the mind so closely at all times to maintain peace of mind. Yeah. I suppose my quality, my, to qualify my question, maybe it's something like... So, yes, so I'm still involved in need, intensity. Yeah. Do, do you need and to go... And if you ever saw me ride a bike in New York City, people are just like, I saw you on your bike. I called your name, but you were already gone. You're still intense. Well, but, well, I yeah, still maybe, love maybe exhilaration. That negates, maybe that negates my, my, my question, but my kind of question is like looking back on that stuff and it's easy for like, and I do the same thing. It's sort of like, like, well, don't have to practice until you're blue in the face and half killing yourself. You know, that's kind of not the you point. Do of yoga. You do Or do so you? Or did, you need, did you need to go to Mysore all those uh, years and struggle and suffer, you know, and or or can we just negate that, that and say all oh, you need is fifteen minutes and watch your healthy diet and you know like it you know I, I or do you need to go through it you know can here's anyone what tell I would you say. most practitioners that are interested in Ashtanga yoga or that can benefit from Ashtanga yoga obviously anyone can benefit if they you know show up and they have a skillful teacher um, will benefit from five Surya Namaskara A, three Surya Namaskara B, some standing asanas, some focus sitting, bam. Go to their job that they love and do the best work there. Go to their family that they adore and do the best work there. They will show up. Um, Isn't that the same as yoga? Absolutely. So the method, the yoga method, in, you know, in your perspective doesn't have any other attention apart from a worldly or is it something other i mean having being aligned with our dharma and having an opportunity to earn our income based on our dharma that is the main tenant of the teachings of india the householder teachings of india dharma artha kama moksha so one has their dharma they have their duty well to their parents who gave them life. They have a duty to the creator, the God, the Brahman, the all, uh, however they each define it, for their innate gifts. We each have innate gifts. Um, and additionally, it is our duty to share our, my individual innate gifts in the world, your individual, this student here, everyone, your, your gifts are yours, it's your duty to share them. And when you share your gifts, it is, you must, that is how you earn your way. Artha. We are not beggars. We are not sannyasi. We have not renounced. We are householders. We, I, you know, we are in the world. We love culture. When yoga students, usually male, uh, in their prime years for marriage and having children in their 20s or 30s, would say to Patabi Joyce or Saraswati or Dr. Jayshree and her brother, or family professor Narasimhan, oh, I'm Brahmacharya. They'd be like, you're Brahmacharya. Who's your guru? How, how are you renounced? Why do you have money in your pocket? It's like, if you renounce, you renounce completely. It's like, this is the time to get married. This is to, the time to live in the world. The, the world is a gift. The world is an expression of the creator. Um, I think I don't want to get off on track with that yet, mm -hmm. but um, so we have our dharma. It is our duty to share our gifts in the world and to earn artha, to earn dhanam wealth. And when we earn some money, we pay our debts with it. We look after our parents and we earn some money. We set up our household. We look after our family, our children, our, that is our duty. And we keep earning and we look after our community. This is the Indian way. And this is the, the Indian traditions. And it's part of the yoga. It's what the Bhagavad Gita is about. The Bhagavad Gita is a householder's manual. Um, and then it is not a renunciate's manual because Krishna, uh, not Krishna, Arjuna says with his bow trembling and repulation, hair standing up on end and sweat pouring from him. The Gandava bow drops from his palm and he sits down and he says, I will not fight. And Krishna, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, Krishna says, 
you must do your duty, you must fight. So this duty is around uh, ideally a peaceful society that works with the gratitude for our gifts and sharing them in the world and earning our way and then having pleasure, comma. You know, today everyone can have pleasure because everyone has credit cards. So no one has to earn their pleasure, so to speak. Even when I was, you know, in the 80s, there was like no ATM machines. If you earned whatever, $200 and you couldn't get money, the banks were, I think banks closed at like three o'clock on a Friday. You could not get money. That was it. You had to live all weekend on that money. Um, And you, you valued it. If I wanted to travel to Europe or to Guatemala or to Mexico, it's like, I had that money. I counted it out. I took that trip. Now we can earn our pleasure. We we can, we can have pleasure without earning it because we go into enormous debt. But ideally, when one has fulfilled all their duties and they have some extra wealth, they have to have pleasure, the best of the best, because the, the needs of the senses are so strong and they're driving forward. If we do not fulfill and satisfy the senses, it corrupts. This is corrupting for the human. And we can see this in many societal ills, not only in the yoga world, you know, in other worlds through traumas mm. and mm. everything like that. Mm. So um, then, it's you know what? It's a very different p- brushstroke to the normal way that yoga can often be taken as a kind of fatalism. And I think, and I also and read- And I'm going to comment on that too, yeah, Adam. Well, I want to, yeah. I mean, we haven't got all, you know, we haven't, we'll try and stick to an hour. So I'm going to want to as much out of you as I can. And um, so let's-, let's Well, just here's kind of, what I want to say about that. My yeah, yeah. thesis okay. on that is that- you came to a crisis point. I like it when you came back to New York and I think you write something about you know, how you'd gone to a studio and you assumed, well, you know, like, you know, we, we, I've had the same experience. You've done like 20 years of yoga. You've got all this experience. You've got the Sanskrit. You've got all this stuff. And you realize, actually, that's not necessarily, you know, the success key anymore, you know? Like if you haven't got, you know, X number of followers on Instagram, who cares about you? You know what I mean? Like, and you, and you weren't doing well. And it sounds like there was a shift and you just thought, well, you know, what is it then? You know, like, was there a shift in your pr- I approach? I would say that there was several, there was like the big bang <laughs> mm. in my world, which was my marriage ended. Mm. My stepmother was dying. My father was overwhelmed with her health. My father simultaneously was having strokes and his health was falling apart. And I um, was leaving my beautiful place I had lived for three years of Hawaii Mm. and um, wondering, you know, what was next? I wanted to get back to, one, my father was ill on the East Coast and I wanted to get back to a more like earlier creative part of myself, which is definitely aligned with New York City and New York. And I have friends there from every stage of life, you know, from Mm -hmm. five years old onward and many yoga friends. Of course, I was involved in Jiva Mukti and Kundalini and Ashtanga Yoga, you know, so many things. So, and then the arts and then just the East Village scene. When I went back to the East Village after having been away for 20 years, some of my neighbors were like, oh my God, I didn't know you were still in the neighborhood. Like 20 years have passed. Oh, wow, you're still in the neighborhood. I hadn't seen you. Um, so, and then Patabi Joyce died. Patabi Joyce was ill and dying. And I had a total health collapse from vitamin B12 anemia and B12 anemia is real. Uh, and it's excruciating and it is fatal. Uh, it's crippling and it's fatal and it's real. And yes, I always supplemented with vitamin B12. Um, Mm -hmm. so I had, all of these things happening. I had enough external reason reasons for total exhaustion mm. and anxiety. Mm. But unbeknownst to me, I had a major internal reason for exhaustion and anxiety and sleeplessness um, and um, like worry and fear because mm. B12 anemia is actually 
can create madness. So, and then Patabi Joyce was at the end of his life and then he died. My father died a year to the day from Patabi Joyce. Right. Um, and so there was a lot of end of life around me and a lot of exhaustion. I could see the end of an era coming and it's very common. We see it in government. We see it in business. We see it, you know, in other communities where the, you know, the, the founding father uh, passes on and there's chaos. And so there was a looming chaos around Ashtanga, the world, not for the students, the practitioners. No, we still got out of bed every day and did our practice. But having been someone who started an Ashtanga yoga school in 1996 and traveled to India often three months at a time, once six months at a time, um, and um, there was that, there was a lot of change and I could just see the mainstream swell of yoga, which is fantastic. But Adam, as you may have learned from now, I have never taken my cues from the mainstream. Um, it's doesn't, it's not interesting. There's no appeal <laughs> in this kind of homogenized, um, you know, vanilla or whatever. And so I, and I would say just to revisit something you said about, I don't know mm. if you said like not having success or failing or something I've always had, but just to, you yeah. know, comment. Mm. I've always had um, a great facility for private clients. Mm. And so I have private clients today that I had 25 years ago. These are people that I have been in their home, taught them yoga. Um, and my, I established some private clients when I moved to New York City again, 11 years ago. They are still my clients today. So, um, and Ashtanga Yoga, when I learned it, and the way, of course, it's meant to be taught is one-on-one. -on -one. That is the opportunity and the experience that we had in Mysore um, in those early years in what we call the old shala, only 12 people in the room, sometimes not enough students there to be 12 in the room, maybe only eight or six. It was all one-on-one. -on -one. And that is how I taught my Mysore room. That is how I teach all my students. Um, getting back to the 15 minutes a day, people would be leaving India or they would be leaving five days of study with Patabi Joyce in Encinitas or New York City. And they would say, thank you, thank you, thank you. But I'm, I'm going home. I have to wake up at 6 a.m. I have to get my kids ready for school. I have an hour and a half commute to my job. I don't get home until nine at night. I'm exhausted. And if I heard, I heard him say it easily 500 times, 15 minutes is enough. And uh, I didn't believe him mm -hmm. because I'm that person that I want to wake up at two 30. Mm -hmm. When people say like, you wake up at two 30 or you wake up at three. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm, t I'm radical. I'm badass. Are you still doing uh, that now? What's that? You're still doing that now. Well, has your well I did it when I sailed through the East river <laughs> and covered 30 nautical miles and sailed in deep, fog like milk from New York to New Jersey and could only hear the fog horns of giant ships crossing the channel. I suppose um, what I'm going to drive out in the whole interview is has your perspective and you know like just trying to kind of you've got so yes. many things going on. Students uh, have different stages. Have, have you no but have you changed I, your perspective on yoga or has it has it transitioned or is yoga continuously been the same thing for you or more you know in the more recent years now you're a yoga, you know i see you know you call yourself more yoga educator is that the same right. thing is your would your key message have been the same 20 years ago when you were the mysore student you know and now you know or is yoga kind of you mean know, I, 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 the reason i say educator is because in my <laughs> era we were always yoga teachers yeah, right. Yeah. I know it's And nice, some of them go, I, I, you're I, a yoga teacher. Yeah. And they had ex they had some respect for you yeah. or some curiosity. With the whole yoga alliance, 
mainstreaming of the 200 hour teacher training, suddenly everyone is a yoga instructor. And when people say to me like, oh my God, you're a yoga instructor. My niece just graduated from college and she's a yoga instructor. I would be like, oh no, you didn't. Oh no, you didn't. Like, um, Show me someone who isn't a yoga and teacher. That's um, right. So I think it was really a pushback against that word yoga instructor. Well, also educate, it doesn't educate, which is what definitely what you're doing, take on a, a much greater holism than simply, well, you know, you people come to class and you go, well, do the primary series. And then they go, well, that's, that's it. That's I never did that. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean though? Like you're I'm, talking- I'm doing the same <laughs> thing when I teach, I'm doing the same thing that I've always done. And you're so many more things into it now. I don't know whether you always were. Yes, you, because you, I've grown as a, right. I'm a, I'm a perpetual lifelong learner. Mm. And I certainly see there are stages of a student. There are stages of a student in anything. I think, you know, we all wrote bad poetry in our lives, right? And if we keep writing poetry, I hope that it gets better, right? <laughs> but Tabby Joyce used to say, if people really wanted to learn second, they really wanted to learn third, or they were learning third and fourth, and someone would be like, oh, they're learning third and fourth. He would go, that is just circus. Most people can benefit from roga chikitsa. You just take some primary series, you will have benefits. Some people's mind is moving too much and they need all these asanas. This is not for everyone. Um, And what about all the, I mean, you know, the chanting is amazing that you do. What what about that? Is that necessary? It's necessary. I love it. Ultimately, Adam, the only reason I believe we do anything is because it gives us pleasure. And... Chanting gives me great pleasure. What do you, what do you like about it? What, what is it? You know, this sounds a stupid question, but what is it you like about it? Because it's quite devotional. And, and the New York the thing and the art is not necessarily it devotional. Seems to be devotional. It's kind of, the chanting, doesn't it come across as devotional? The Yoga Sutra is not devotional. Um, there's really only one reference to devotion, the Ishta Devata. Um, that Swadhyayat Ishta Devata Sampra Yogaha for one who is established in Swadhyaya, the study of the Moksha Shastra, the traditional yoga texts, they will have a union with their Ishta Devata. Hmm. I don't mean devotional. Sorry, yeah, to, to, to reframe that question, I didn't really mean devotional in a bhakti sense. I more meant devotional in, in a wider um, parameters as a discipline. As a discipline, as, as opposed a discipline, to memorizing the entire Yoga Sutra and yeah, chanting it every discipline. day. Yeah, so you, it's, it's just two people to chant it, and yeah. I suppose it's just kind of one, two different things going on here. One is a super it's only two in your mind. <laughs> well, <laughs> Advaita, there's only one. So, you, so expression, so I mean, expression and discipline can go hand in hand. I'm just kind of trying to get a picture of how that looks. Right. So, um, you know, for me to use music or sound or language to create an exalted feeling, that's what drew me to acting. Right. And so to chant the Yoga Sutras or to chant some other stotram or some portions of the Bhagavad Gita or some mantra and to have to create you know, uh, an emotional shift or a nervous system shift. That's, that's very beautiful for me. As we are learning, as we're memorizing the sutra in the Sanskrit, we begin to actually have the opportunity to learn the meaning of each term. And in learning the meaning of each term, we are, it's like jnana yoga. We're just cracking our consciousness open to the meaning of the the classical yoga, the yoga darshan. So that's an amazing path. We see a lot of Ashtanga yoga students, uh, not a lot. We see some extraordinarily uniquely, you know, gifted Ashtanga yoga students moving into the Sanskrit, um, whether through universities and becoming masters and PhDs or through these traditional kind of Brahmin, almost like becoming a Brahmin and taking on enormous amounts of Sanskrit knowledge. So um, 
what I wanted to say about this idea of yoga and discipline, all of the early yogis that came to the West were renunciates. They were sannyasis. They wore orange robes. They belonged to an ashram order. They had renounced marriage, children, money. Sannyasis are not allowed to touch money. Yeah. Um, they've renounced sex, a household, all of those things. So Swami Vivekananda famously came to the United States in 1893 for the um, Parliament of World Religions, and he galvanized the parliament. Uh, he, I think he went into a state of samadhi, and he shared like a Shakti pot experience with everyone. And it was so galvanizing. He actually had like a touring show, like a tent revival, and he toured through the United States. He was a renunciate. He did not support a household. He did not, you know, charge a lot of money or he didn't have to have a household. Um, we look at Swami Yogananda, same thing, orange robes, renunciate. And then we look at the Woodstock era yogis, the anti-Vietnam War era, the student protest era, the civil rights movement era. And um, these were renunciates. Even Gandhi became a renunciate. He was a married man. He had a family. He was a lawyer, he was a householder, and he took up this call to lead India to self-rules um, based on really Hindu, Vedic, but Hindu principles, Dharma Shastra principles, and he became a renunciate. He renounced his wife at that time, and he led a renunciate's life. So... And then Swami Satchitananda, Swami Vishnu Devananda, they were renunciates. That was Leslie's early teacher, the Shivananda yoga. That was the most influential yoga through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, completely eclipsed by Ashtanga yoga. So they were all renunciates. So mm -hmm. all the hippies and all the beatniks and all the yoga people were like, oh, I can just pay 50 cents for yoga. Oh, yoga is free. Because coming from renunciates, yes, the yoga is nearly free. But our teachers, Krishnamacharya, householder, Patabi Joyce, householder, Jayashri, householder, BKS Iyengar, householder, um, it is, you know, Sri Jessica Char, householder. They must earn and they must earn well. And I know it can be very irksome for non-Indians when Indians uh, happily share the level of wealth that they have. But they have done their duty, Adam. Dharma, Artha. So that's not a contradiction. No, no contradiction to, you know, the, the progressing with the methods in accumulating wealth or, you know. Right, and I think... Well, an expression well, I, I, well, I've always, you know, seems to the, the <laughs> refrain which is frustrating you over this interview is the difference between, I suppose, expressiveness, which I love, you know, about your, your you know, what you do online and, you know, the, the ability to sit quietly and memorize whole chunks of text, ancient texts and lead a disciplined life in that respect. And, and is there any, you know, discord between the two worlds or, you know, the, the idea I liked also in your, you know, something I read of yours, which was the, the yoga student quite happily embraces suffering as if it's a mantle to be held rather than going out and, you know, kind of like, I mean, you're doing a lot of coaching. That's kind of your main thing now, I think, right? And, and like kind of, you know, trying to almost get something out of the world, where, you know, which it seems, you know, but in a more... Give something to the world and get something back rather than right, just okay, give something okay. to the world I mean, the, and complain about the fact that you don't have any yeah. money. The questions are there to be qualified, you know, by you. <laughs> um, well, Adam, I would say that certainly th there is a type of, there's a characteristic that many people that are attracted to yoga and yoga teaching share. And it is a characteristic of um, living with less and thinking that, uh, maybe it's not right to ask for money or maybe it's not good to have a lot of money. One of the 
biggest um, criticisms of Patabi Joyce by other yoga students or people that would come to study with him was that he was so expensive and all he cared about was money. And here we were in this tiny little dingy room and there's only like 30 students and he lives in a home with only two chairs um, and leads the most simple life. Uh, He did start to earn wealth, probably not until his 80s. So, but I do think that there is a quality of a yoga teacher and I do uh, coach, you know, yoga teachers to earn a living. Um, You're in UK. I think you're in France now. You see here in the United States, no one pays for us to retire. We don't have pensions. We don't have health insurance. We have to earn all that on our own. Uh, we don't, our, our taxes don't allow us to retire at 58 or 60 or 65. So if someone has chosen an alternative life as a artist or as a yoga teacher, and a lot of my artist friends that I greatly admired, you know, who were 10 and 15 and 20 years older than I was when I was 20, they are 70 and 80 year old, you know, uh, 60 year old yoga teachers with no help, um, excuse me, artists, great artists with no health insurance, with with health problems, with their landlords trying to put them out of the building because they only pay $400 rent and everybody else is paying $1,500 or $2,000. And um, so here in the United States, you know, yoga is amazing. It's dreamy. As Swami Yogananda said, um, you know, practice yoga, but lock your car. <laughs> like... Like luck, you know, (laughs) yes, you practice yoga, but someone could still break into your car. Yes, practice yoga, but (laughs) save up some money. Yes, practice (laughs) yoga, but earn an income, start a pension, have health insurance. So sometimes it's leveled at me like, oh my God, all you Americans do is like Mm -hmm. care about money. It's like, regrettably, we have to care about money because we don't have the structures in place that Europeans and Brits benefit from. And so yoga teachers, uh, amazing people who've dedicated themselves to yoga at 45 or 50 or 55 or 60 or 65, they get cancer. They need a hip replacement. They have, you know, develop MS or other, you know, Mm. heart disease. I mean, this happens to yoga people too, and they have nothing. And they find themselves with these terrible feelings of anguish. But, So yes, we do need to earn a living, but there is a characteristic in yoga teachers. People become yoga teachers. They all share this thing that maybe money is a little bad. You shouldn't ask for it, although you need it. And so I encounter yoga teachers all the time who have accepted that they don't have money. I think that that's some skata that impression existed and it drew them to yoga. Um, Because I also hear yoga teachers complain, I was in line for that big yoga job and someone else got it. Those classes were rightfully mine, but someone else got them. Um, No, speak up. If you want those classes, if you know, speak up, let it be known. Don't just wait and think that the wheels are turning in the background. Mm. Um, there's, uh, I heard, um, I'm trying to think of his name at the moment. Um, the kind of a chiropractor, naturopathic guy in India, um, who has a great clinic there and the name of it is escaping me. He was working with a client, an Indian gentleman and giving him health advice. And, and he said, He like, look at these people from the West. They're coming here to learn yoga. He kind of pointed to me. They're coming here to learn yoga. They have good health. They look after themselves. And the Indian patient was like, but it doesn't seem right just to have health and appearance for vanity's sake. And the physician said, the reason to have health is so that you do not cause despair and suffering to those that love you. Hmm. It's so that you do not expect others to look after you. Yoga is a radical path. It is Mm. a solo path. The Mm. promise of yoga, of the yoga darshana, 
of Patanjali or what we would call the Yoga Darshanam, which is based in the Patanjali, the promise of that is radical, that the individual all by themselves with the teachings and the practices can come to freedom from suffering. That is the promise um, that we individually can come to that. Mm -hmm. And that is what I believe sends us, wakes us early in the morning or sends us trekking off to India or, you know, doing things that are not popular. Um, But we, but ultimately, and that will give, that gives us a life of meaning. If we're griping about it the whole way through um, and we're in a place of competition and pettiness, then then maybe this, these yoga sadhana, these are not the practices for that person. Mm-hmm. But for yoga teachers or yoga students or long-time yoga practitioners to expect other people to look after them, um, well, then they're, they certainly haven't matured through the yoga practices. They're like children. And in some ways we can maintain our childlike mind, but also gain, attain to our wisdom mind. So what's the key message for you? I mean, just kind of get a practical hold yeah, of what yeah. you're doing now, which is, you know, which is many things, I think, and you're coaching people and I guess you're doing yoga with them, but you're, but when you, when you're giving them a yoga system, I assume it, we were talking before it's, you know, kind of based on the Trish Dana technique, you know, the, the underpins Ashtanga, right. And are you bringing into that all different facets of, of coaching or, you know, what's your key, what's your key intention or key message? with the yoga that you're trying to help people with or or just simply as a mentor, you know, that people should live their life of meaning, right? This human birth, as it says in the Bhagavad Gita, as Patabi Joyce often reminded us when he quoted and paraphrased from the Bhagavad Gita, this human life is a gift. The Ayurveda, the Charaka Samhita says the same thing. This human life is it's echoed throughout the, the yoga texts and the Vedic texts. It really is a gift and it's, and uh, so let it live your life of meaning and embracing practices and taking techniques and practices and discipline coming from yoga traditions and other traditions can support our nervous system, which so is the foundation. That. You, you still need that discipline. You can't just Absolutely. be Absolutely. Discipline is key. Right. So you can't just go out and express, you know, everything. You can go out and express, but you'll pay for it. You know, go out and express, go to your friend's wedding and have a giant piece of cake and 12 glasses of champagne and dance the night away and, you know, get blisters from your high heels. Um, Absolutely. (laughs) But yeah, it's going to take you three days, you know, to get back on the mat. But was it worth it? I hope so. I hope it was absolutely worth it. There's no judge standing over us. There's no judge. You know, the yogi is completely independent, but we do tap into the spanda. We tap into the creative force. And another thing I want to say about the yoga practices, um, we believe, we are told that they are cumulative. Yeah. We are gathering prana. We are generating prana. Vitality, my best translation for prana would be vitality. We are... We are educating our nervous system. Right. And so we're gathering vitality and prana. Now, am I going to go do three hours of asanas at three in the morning and maybe deplete my vitality? Take it away from all these other things that I want to do. I remember reading an interview with Swami Rama of the Himalayan Institute, Himalayan Institute, I don't know, 25 years ago. And they're like, oh, you know, Swami, what yoga do you do? He said, I have no time for yoga. If I can take yoga nidra for even 15 seconds, five minutes a day, I'm good. So, you know, we're like, I remember being in kindergarten and there was like certain things that I love to do in kindergarten. I love to jump rope or I love to play with these certain little dollhouse and pretend I was having a tea party. That was an incredibly important part of who I am in my education, but I'm not going back to kindergarten. I'm not going to still have tea 
parties with empty cups. So our practices change. Our education changes. When I see, you know, really when I see yoga students who are clearly in pain and they are yanking themselves into asanas that their body no longer wants to do. For me, that's like the mortification of the flesh. Um, that's, that's, you know, I would not recommend that to my students. So you definitely give a lot of context to the practices and then that's how you would teach it. I mean, you kind of build up. So you kind of define the intention, define what you're doing, you know, and, and include, and do you think it's important to include the, you know, the philosophy and the chanting? I mean, you obviously are very knowledgeable about all that. I mean, I mean most people, I mean, I, I run many different workshops with different teachers. I can tell you, if you put a handstand, it would be a very popular workshop. Absolutely. The, the philosophy or the, or the pranayama, not so much, you know? Absolutely. Um, well, the student, there is that student who will eventually develop a desire for the philosophy some attraction toward the Sanskrit and interest in the sutras. Will it come they, just through doing it? Just through the physical? It will, will, it, will it come? It will come. All right. Yes. Hope for us all. And um, we experience our consciousness, you know, it's called asmita, you know, from our own individual self. We're each the star of our own movie, so to speak. It may be a low budget movie, but uh, may never get distribution. But we are each the star, star of our own life, and we are at the center of our life. That's called asmita, and we're in a, a kind of a limited view, and we learn in that. And as we have more life experiences, as we take yoga disciplines and yoga practices and things like that, um, this starts to change, uh, and we come into a more expanded consciousness. I think many people cling to familiar practices like a, you know, like a life ring <laughs> out in a turbulent sea. I think this idea of, um, you know, there's a concept that's touched on in the Yoga Sutra of where when one takes the vow of the yama, one gives up these limited associations of family and in a sense looks to the whole world as a universal family. I think to be able to open the entire, you know, that the whole universe is opening in front of us step by step. And are there opportunities to connect, to learn, to exchange, to grow, to feel safe and secure and you know to look after ourselves and others as we go um and to really feel that we're part of a human family mm. so um that's for me that's the path how is is this limitless consciousness and a limitlessness of experiences that can occur with that. I do think daily peace of mind is really important. I've been, I've been practicing, especially in these unique times, um, this Maitri Karuna Mudita Upeksha Nam Sukaduka Punya Apunya Avisha Nam Pavana Tashita Prasadanam. So Patanjali gives us this wonderful sutra. Um, uh, sutra chapter two, sutra 33, um, chapter one, sutra 33, where he says that we can really have some illumination and peace of mind, almost a sweetness of mind. And that peace of mind and sweetness of mind will allow us to, to further experience yoga illumination that the way that we act towards others. And so when I meet people who are in sukha, they have some happiness and ease in their life. I meet them with maitri, friendliness. When I encounter people that are suffering, dukkha, I meet them with karuna, compassion. And um, um, mudita, when I meet people who are 
really act with like great virtue. They're just doing amazing things in the world. They just exhibit so much, you know, kindness and compassion and boundless energy and looking, caring for others and everything. We share um, joy with that person. And when we encounter people that are not established in an or a moral or ethical code, people who behave, you know, behave with harm that we meet them really that we with a neutrality and that practice has served me very well during this so-called pandemic um because there's so much fear mongering on the news there's so much People are interfering and judging and gossiping about each other's lives. They should act this way. They shouldn't act that way. Mm -hmm. And to really be moving through the world, applying that, it brings peace of mind. And from that place of peace of mind, we can, we can love more. We can be more compassionate. We can engage with more ease. We can support others we can be free from, um, you know, self-harm, the self-harm of anxiety and stress and fear. Wonderful. Okay. Well, it's a nice note to, to finish on. Um, I had so many, I, there were so, so many more questions. I know, you, Adam. I I'll, I'll, you know, I'll try not to act like but, Bob Dylan yeah, I mean, in his early we, interviews and not answer questions. Yeah. We need um, but I would say yeah. that I apply a Shtanga Yoga method in all my teaching. That includes teaching people with MS, people with spinal cord injury, um, creating protocols for veterans with PTSD. It is all based in Tristanam and Vinyasa. It has nothing to do with those uh, pictures of the body, of mm. those sequences. Yeah. And, um, but I will always teach a beginner those sequences. That's how they learn. If they're able to move, I will teach them those sequences. Yeah. Yeah. And I always teach the individual. And when I, uh, was invited to create a program for spinal cord injury and I met the representative from the mayor's office on disability, he said, Oh, Kiki. Uh, and he has had spinal cord injury. Uh, and he said, I see that you're teaching adaptive yoga. And I said, adaptive yoga? I don't teach adaptive yoga. I would never adapt yoga. I teach yoga to the individual. Yeah, I understood. The, and, yeah, qualification. Yeah, absolutely. So it's about that communication. Yeah. Yeah. There's someone in front of me. Let yeah. me tap into, are they listening? Can they hear? Are they breathing and teaching yeah. them yeah. the yoga? And it's going to look different for everyone, but it's always going to be based in Tristanam. I'd say my main practices are meditation, um, steadiness of asana. I'll do a, a few asanas. Um, I recently registered a Guinness Book of World Records for a downward dog. I held it for an hour and 20 seconds. People are like, how did you do it? I was like, Ashtanga Yoga Method, firmness of asana. Were you doing bandhas? Duh, of course I was doing bandhas, ujjayi breath. And I really did it to show that asana is, as Patanjali says, tira sukham asanam. It needs steadiness and stability. Um, in terms of movement exploration, I have explored movement from a very young age. And a lot of the movement exploration that I'm doing now is more around developmental movement and not so much bilateral, but really cross-lateral movement. And I think somatics is an extraordinary study. I just started doing something called WEC method. I have studied in the last number of years, Feldenkrais. Um, I've been uh, doing exercises from Patrick McEwen's um, work. I don't know, for eight years. So it doesn't have to be coming from the Indian system. Now I'm really yeah. interested in, um, in just really 
integrated vital mu- mm-hmm. movement. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't want to feel like restricted in the movement. Yeah. I right. see a lot of, you know, the Ashtanga Yoga method, uh, doing all these asanas, it's all these asanas are preparing us for sitting. Mm. And so uh, yoga practitioners are great sitters. They're meant to sit. That's what that whole array of asanas, putting the legs behind the head and everything like that, so that we could sit in meditation or in lotus for an hour, two hours, or three hours. And I'm, you know, I became a great sitter, but I lost, I left behind my ability to move. Um, and so I'd be like, oh, I'm too tired to do that, or how long is the hike, or whatever. And I was like, whoa. I want to move. And so I'm just exploring great uh, movement systems, which I'm loving. And I'm also helping, um, you know, people overcome enormous pain and, uh, or so-called aging or surgeries, botched surgeries and helping them move with the principles of Ashtanga yoga, but also bringing everything else in my tool belt, my tool box, my tool belt, uh, which is never ending. I'm I'm always searching. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Thank and you I hope so to much. Get you back, I hope to get you back again because I have so many more questions to ask. So, um, but yeah, thank yeah, wonderful. Um, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me, Adam. And uh, just namaste. My respect to you. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.